All right, so sorry. We're going to start today on, in lecture where we left off in the video tapes on HIV AIDS. Uh, you remember you are responsible for all of the material, and by the end of tonight, I'll have it all online if you, uh, you know, would like to hear it as well as study it. So anyway, um, today we're going to start at pregnancy, HIV in pregnancy, then go to HIV testing, then go to HIV treatment and vaccines, and then we'll probably start on the 13 parasites. Uh, in my night class tonight, I'm going to go over the 13 parasites first, so I'll have both of the videos online for you uh, so that you have time to review them. Uh, the best thing to do to study for the bi-weekly is to go to the one that I have posted somewhere here. Uh, let me just show you. That practice test is very, very helpful. And let's see, this is the link to the next test. And you click here. And then if you want to look at any of the videos, all of the HIV AIDS videos and the 13 parasites will be on tonight. So click on this little yellow line that says YouTube videos. Um, in your next class, these are the things that are going to be due. And that means on Wednesday for you, bring a Scantron 884E, the same one you've been doing and you're going to have 200 multiple choice over everything since the midterm and that is acellular and eukaryotic parasites so that going from the smallest to the largest that would be uh, viroids, uh, satellites, prions, general viruses, HIV AIDS and the 13 eukaryotic parasites and uh, your typed formal unknown report which uh, we finished doing the lab over three weeks ago so everybody should have a paper ready, pretty, beautiful, ready to be graded. Yes? Um, I was looking at the APA format online and they were saying something about page, we're running head. Page. Yeah, a running head would be nice to put in there. You don't have to. I'm not going to count against it, but you know, if you go to the um, footer and header, you can put one in if you want. And also on the unknown, that you, the paper that you have posted online, mm -hmm. are, the, are the references, the way no. that they have them, are they updated like that? Or the I'm reference, saying, the I don't understand format. exactly. The format the is format correct. The reference is correct, it's updated? Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, uh, when you're putting something online, it's kind of hard to get it exactly right because um, you can't, for instance, between references, they're supposed to be double-spaced. And within references, they're supposed to be single-spaced. And indented any line after the first. But sometimes it comes out both double-spaced online when you put it on the internet. But anyway, the paper, when you come in the door, what you're going to do is you're going to hand me your unknown paper, and then I'm going to grade it and put my comments on the title page while you're taking the test. When you're finished with the test, I'll give you the paper back. You'll look over it before you leave the room and if you have any questions on how to fix it. And the grade I put on there, if you, if you, you know, didn't make up any data or didn't do anything terrible, uh, should be in the 90s. And then you take it home, do the corrections, rip off that title page, staple it to the final draft that has the corrections on it. That way I can follow, did you do the corrections? And that's the grade that goes on your grade sheet. Um, so then the other thing you're supposed to hand in in the next class is the study sheet that you prepared for parasites. And that is the 13 parasites, seven questions about each one. I already have it online. All you have to do is just put it in your own words for uh, making a study sheet for the test that's coming up. Now, since that material, the Unit 3 material, which is acellular and eukaryotic parasites, since that is half the final, I'm going to give you the study sheet back. So you're going to turn it in, 
And when you pick up your paper, you're going to also pick up your study sheet so you can study for the Paris, continue to study for the parasites for the final. So three things you owe me on Wednesday. You're going to take the bi-weekly test. You're going to uh, turn in the formal unknown report. And you're going to give me the 25 points that are left in the class for bonus, which is the 13 parasites, seven questions. Yes. Only 11. Only 11 what? There are 13. There are 13. Okay, there is. The 13 parasites are. Malarial diseases. That's tish, microscopic tissue roundworms.
though actually there are 15 instead of 13. If you do each one separately. Okay, so um, what else did I want to do? All right, so the final exam is the 28th from 1.30 to 3.30 at Scantron 884E, the 29th, 8 to 10 a.m., and the 30th from 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, if you don't want to come to your 8 a.m., you have to send me a request for a seat number. In the final exam packet goes a uh, sheet uh, that has your like this that has uh, a envelope with your last name, first name, class, ID number, uh, semester, phone number, and email. And in this goes your lab record book. And in your lab record book, if you want to put the ages uh, donation on the front cover, Remember, attach it to the inside of the front cover or I won't see it. And if you need a signature, that's also got to be on the lab record book for uh, checkers. And if you haven't picked up your checkers signature, do it before you leave today. Remember that the lab record book has got to be blue or black ink. It's got to be no white out, no erasures. Any error is flashed through, initial date, and correct. No pages removed, no loose leaf, no binder, just a regular sewn, uh, what do they call that? Um, there's a name for it. What is it? Composition notebook, right. Um, also in your final exam packet goes the last grade sheet, which will come out this weekend. And it will have all of your bonus points. It will have your formal unknown report. And it will have your last bi-weekly on it. So you put that last grade sheet in there, sign it. The last draft of your formal unknown report with the original uh, comments that I put on it, stapled to the top. Your take-home Micro 40 final exam if you took Micro 40. And then your final exam bonus paper, and remember you can choose to do a summary of and the band played on. And this, or the AIDS denialist paper. And it must be one and a half to two pages long. Actually I put one to one and a half, and one and a half to two. for five points on the final exam. Anyone have any question about any of these things that are coming up? We're almost to the last. This is our last formal lecture, oh my god. And then uh, test days. Yep. What do you mean Wednesday? Wednesday's that. Formal unknown report, your bi-weekly test. Just the test. It'll take the whole time. It's 200 multiple choice questions. That's a bi-weekly that counts twice. Oh, okay. No excitement. I don't know if I could contain my thrill. So thrill did it. All right. So we're going to uh, start here. And uh, let me just cut down the lights to get rid of the glare and grab me something to wet my throat so I don't die. And we'll begin. we're going to start off uh, talking about who and what in the infection of the disease 
and all that. Uh, let's review a little bit who discovered the disease. The person who discovered the description described the first people who had it described the disease. Who discovered the disease? <laughs> He lived in Los Angeles. He was a doctor. Nope. Michael Gottlieb discovered the disease. Okay, who discovered the uh, virus that causes the disease? Oh my God, we're all going to flunk this test. This is a weekend that you should have been studying all this. All right. Person who dis the people who discovered the virus, they named it LAV, was Montagnier and Barry Sinousse. And I'm not going to ask anymore since you don't even know the most basics. But the next one is uh, who discovered the blood test that causes the disease, who patented it first, and that was Gallo. Who discovered the first human cancer virus, Gallo. Um, Today we're going to learn that the person that uh, designed the blood test, uh, confirmation test called the Western Blot was Getchell. Uh, the person who proved that the virus was in the blood supply was Fiorino with baby AIDS. Uh, the person who named the disease when it was misconstrued as uh, by everybody thinking it could only be a gay disease because it was originally gay-related immune deficiency disease and a man by the name of Bruce Bowler changed the name uh, to Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. The International Conference on Virology changed the name because originally the virus was known as LAB. That's what the French discovered and published in 1983. And then it was borrowed, stolen, or whatever you want to call it, misappropriated by Gallo as HTLV-3 in 1984. In 1985, the blood test was approved and patented by Gallo. Uh, the University of California isolated their own, named it AIDS-related virus. And then uh, by 1987, uh, International Conference on Virology Naming had changed the name to HIV, which stands for Human Immunodeficiency, all one word, Immunodeficiency Virus, Type 1. And the reason they changed the name was because both the French and the Americans had acted unethically, and they decided to take the name away from both of them. Uh, the French found it first, but it was misappropriated, and then they retaliated and wouldn't share information, neither with the Americans, and so they changed the name to HIV. Um, what else do you need to know about uh, people? Uh, Jim Curran was head of the Sexually Transmitted Disease Branch. He's the one that gave it the name GRID. And, um, did a couple of other mistakes. You remember first he wrote hot stuff. This could save the CDC. Second thing he did wrong was he named it GRID. Third thing he did wrong was say that only people that were in certain risk groups could get the disease. So people started thinking it was their groupings that gave them the disease instead of what they did. And that was a big mistake. And then finally, um, the, and these groupings, remember, was what was the risk groups? People who had more than one sexual partner, prostitutes, IV drug users, and Haitians. An entire country was in a risk group. So uh, this was another bad mistake by the CDC. Uh, right after uh, putting people in risk groups, uh, they made another mistake, uh, and they're last mistake was they decided that they were fixated on this gay thing, so they decided, decided that it, they would alter people's, uh, they would do investigations and do whether or not you could alter people's uh, sexual uh, preference, and of course they found out that that's almost unalterable about after age 9 or 10, people have whatever they like, and they're going to keep it. So. Eventually, they finally got to the right answer, which was list the behaviors. 
that people do, no matter what group they're among, if they do these behaviors, they're in danger of getting this disease. And of course, they have to do these behaviors with someone who has the disease, not just in the air. Now, there are people that believe that if you drive through San Francisco with the windows down, someone will throw in AIDS. So uh, you still have to do this with someone who has the agent of disease, the virus. So anyway, these are what we call the behavioral causes of the disease. And they are listed in order of danger. The most dangerous being up here at the top and the least dangerous down at the bottom. And remember that since blood is considered an organ, when you get a blood transfusion, you're getting an organ transplant. So any organ transplant from a person that is HIV positive will result in a 99.9% uh, chance of becoming positive. And someone in the other class wanted to know what's that 0.01% that doesn't. And that's people who get bone marrow because bone marrow is sterilized. So remember if you get a transplant or a transfusion, <coughs> you are going from someone that is positive, you are going to become positive and be infected with the virus that causes the disease. Don't forget, it takes 15 years after you get the virus before you show any signs, symptoms, or have uh, significant damage to your uh, immune system. So people can walk around for 15 years looking and being exactly the same as you. The only difference is they have a positive blood test and they can infect you. And that's why about 20% of the people in the United States don't know they have HIV because they have done some of these things with people that are positive and gotten infected. Um, another important point about transplantation is a lot of people carry in their wallets the driver's license that says donate my organs. If I'm killed on the freeway or something like that, donate my organs. Remember, those organs cannot be tested if you're early in HIV infection. So, in the past, people have had in their wallets, donate my tit, donate my organs. They were killed on the freeway, and their organs were donated. The blood was checked. But remember, the blood test doesn't tell early in infection. It takes 90 days after infection for the blood test to turn positive. And in that 90 days, you will test negative by the antibody test. Now, if you get the expensive antigen test, remember the antibody is your body's response to infection. Antigen is what causes the infection. So the antigen in HIV is the virus, HIV. If you get the antigen test on those blood, that blood and organs, it still will be negative even though it's positive in the first 10 days after infection. So there is no way to tell if someone's organs are absolutely negative. Because when, if someone's killed you're, and they haven't turned positive, you can't hold their blood in the refrigerator and it turns positive. It stops the moment they're dead. So if they did something in the last 10 days, if you spend the $1,500 to do the antigen test and they were infected, you won't know it. So remember, this is called the window. The window is the period from when you were infected to when the first blood test will show you're positive and you can infect other people. And since no machine is capable of measuring real zero, positive e, the earliest you could detect positive for a $1,500 antigen test is day 10 after infection. Now that we've done all that scary stuff, let's talk about real risk. And real risk is very small. Only about 28 people a year in the United States get infected from blood or tissue that was in the window because the test that they use is very good, because the screening procedure when they ask people questions is very good and there are not many cases of where a person donates their organs and they were positive. So
so your real risk of getting this is extremely small. But you still need to know that uh, material that is tested is there's no real answer of is it zero? Is there no risk? And if, of course, you live in a world that has no risk, uh, you don't live on this earth, you live in fantasy land. Because everywhere you go, there's risk. You just have to keep it in sort of a perspective. All right, the next one is needle stick and needle shearing. And again, we can't give you a really good answer. Uh, if you get a needle stick in a hospital with a dry needle, uh, and you don't know where the blood came from or what the person's status was, your chances are down in the 0.12% range of getting infected by HIV. Uh, it's much higher, remember, for hepatitis C because it takes microscopic drops of blood for hepatitis C. So remember, a dry needle stick from unknown origin, very low risk. What if the person had HIV and a high viral load? but it was a dry needle. In other words, it had already dried and caked and all of that. Maybe uh, you were dumping a, a hamper or something and there was a needle in someone's pocket. Uh, then that risk could go as high as 1.2%. What if during the process of taking someone's blood and they have a high viral load and you stab yourself with that needle? then you're getting it into the 25 to 33% range of, of chance. So needle sticks and needle sharing, it really depends on two factors. Is the needle dry? Is there anything in it? And what is the viral load of the patient that you get stuck with? And remember, there's one important consideration, although you'd have to be an idiot not to figure this out, but you have no right to know what someone else's status is. So if you get needle stuck by someone while you're doing an HIV test, unless they agree, you can't find out what the result was. But in a hospital situation, usually, of course, you can check the chart and see that yourself. But in a testing center, like I was once uh, a phlebotomist back when they had to take blood, and I took blood and got stabbed with somebody's, uh, with a needle, they jerked back. Uh, and I got stuck with a needle. Uh, I had to go on antiviral, retroviral therapy for three months before I finally convinced their lawyers to tell me that they were negative. So, you know, it's a tricky situation, their rights versus yours. Anyone have any questions about the first two? Transplantation and needle sticks. Transplantation, if they're positive, you're probably going to be positive. Uh, needle sticks, depends on whether it was wet or dry and how high the viral load was. But it's still not 100%. Remember, it still just gets up to around 33 to 40%, even in a bad situation. Prostitution, well, this is kind of funny. Uh, nobody loves prostitutes. I know, isn't that sad? <laughs> well, at least nobody will admit loving prostitutes. Let's put it that way. So whenever the governments want to blame somebody, they love to blame prostitutes because there is, you know, except in a few countries, there is no prostitute union to defend them. And just realize this. It is extremely low risk, prostitutes being a significant contributor to a societal problem on HIV. It is not that high a risk. They are often given the blame because nobody likes them and nobody defends them. But in reality, how much did they contribute to a problem, to this problem uh, in the United States? Very little, uh, particularly on the East Coast. It is a, pro a little bit more of a problem than on the West. Anybody have an idea why prostitutes are more of a problem on the East Coast than the West? One, you're right about that. That's where there are more people infected on the East Coast than on the West, but it's evening out now. The big problem is IV drug use. There's a lot more IV drug use 
in prostitutes on the west, on the east coast, where they are kept there by their habit. A lot of the pimps get them hooked on the drugs and then keep them in prostitution. And it's much easier to get HIV by sharing needles than it is through uh, sexual transmission. So on the west coast, prostitutes are not usually addicted to IV drugs, so they're less likely to be transmitting it. Um, this other, what we want to talk about is circumcision, uh, and this was just recently discovered when, when scientists started looking at what exact tissues does HIV like to infect. And its most favorite tissue to infect is what we call Langerhans cells. Langerhans cells are sort of an immune system cells, and they, are, they line the cervix, and they line <coughs> under the foreskin in males. And so uh, we found that circumcision is the cheapest, this is a test question, circumcision is the cheapest thing we can do to slow down the spread of HIV in uh, normal situations in place in large areas like South America, Asia, and Africa. Uh, what we discovered was that if you investigate how many people get, uh, they did this in Nigeria, on one side of the valley they had a whole bunch of Christian uh, villages, on the other side of the very same valley they had a whole bunch of Muslim villages, and the Christian villages, the male population of teenagers had a much higher HIV rate than the Muslim side for the same male teenage population, and they couldn't figure out what the difference was until they realized that most of the Christians were uncircumcised and most of the Muslims were circumcised and the Langerhans cells was what was contributing to this. So it can be as high as a 25% increased risk for uh, male children to pick it up if they're uncircumcised. Uh, so remember, uh, one of the things that WHO is encouraging is that for the least amount of money to protect the most amount of people, baby circumcision of male babies is uh, the most cost-effective way uh, to slow down the spread of HIV in large populations. Uh, so what type of sex is the most dangerous since people have sex everywhere? If you've got a hole, people have sex there. <laughs> And anal sex is the number one most dangerous method. Uh, if infected semen comes in contact with the anus, there is only one cell to the bloodstream. One capillary is the, uh, what the virus has to get through. And while most people think in semen, it's uh, just HIV floating around in semen, it's not. HIV does float around in semen, but that's not what's dangerous. What's dangerous is infected white blood cells exist in semen and vaginal secretions. And at any moment, those white blood cells can explode, releasing thousands upon thousands of particles. So if you're asked, and you will be, what's dangerous in semen and vaginal secretions, what's the answer? <laughs> infected white blood cells. Now. Why are they so dangerous? One, they can explode into millions of particles, but most of all, they don't need a hole. White blood cells can squeeze between capillary linings without a hole. And that's called diapodesis. And so they, will, they can act sort of like a uh, uh, pseudopodia in amoeba by squeezing between cells instead of having a hole to enter the bloodstream. And since there's only one layer between the uh, anus and the capillary, it's very easy for white blood cells to squeeze into the bloodstream and then explode, releasing viral particles. So remember that anal sex is the most dangerous kind of sex and what, uh, two guys, remember Bowler? Who remembers Bowler? Who's Bowler? Or Vela? Why is he important? I talked about it 10 minutes ago. Come on. Somebody's got to be here today. 
Your bodies are here, but your brains, where'd you leave them? Back home working on your paper? No. Uh, all right, the man by the name of Bruce Bola at the first international conference on blood products at the CDC when they had already uh, know, knew that the disease was in the blood supply but hadn't proven that the virus existed yet, uh, Bowler stood up and he said, I, the name of the disease, gay-related immune deficiency disease, is causing problems in getting information because people, you know, how, babies in Miami, how do babies be gay? And he said, well, I want to change the name to AIDS. And so that was the only thing done at that conference. That same man, Bruce Bowler, uh, contributed two other things, major things, many things he contributed to the fight against HIV AIDS, but he contributed uh, three major things to AIDS history. One, naming the virus, I mean naming the disease. Two, with a researcher who was a gynecologist named Bowling, Bowler and Bowling, Bowling was of the University of Texas, he was a gynecologist, discovered that more heterosexuals practice anal sex than homosexuals. But it's a taboo to discuss. What's the word taboo mean? Nobody will talk about it. It's, uh, we all know it's happening. Everybody's heard about it. In the little whispers in the back rooms, in the... Uh, and on the bathroom walls, but nobody will discuss it because it's forbidden. All right? And so what Bowler, Bowling and Bowler discovered in their paper was, one, Bowling had gynecological clinics, um, Planned Parenthood type clinics, that he ran no profit throughout southern Texas, northern Mexico, and Central America. And in blood testing, and you know, remember, these Planned Parenthood clinics do what for poor women? They, they give them pregnancy tests, they give them uh, prenatal vitamins, they provide contraception if they want it, they do pap smears, and they do blood testing. They do women's health for free for poor women. And, of course, a lot of conservatives don't like it because it gives women a choice. If they want to have an abortion, they have an abortion. If they want to use birth control, they get birth control. They don't judge them, they just offer. And then the women make the choice. Well, one of the things that uh, Bowling discovered was that these very poor women that already had like 13 or 10 kids in these very poor areas were having a higher HIV positive blood test than expected. He expected never to get one of these women positive because they were very Catholic, very married, and very poor. How are they going to get this disease? And he noticed that they had a much higher rate than was statistically predicted. And so he couldn't figure out, so he asked them, and they told him nothing. Then he had questionnaires made. They don't read. They are illiterate, most of them. So that didn't work. So finally, he had Hispanic nurses of the same age group ask them, interview them in a friendly, not a, this is a question from the doctor type of interview. And he discovered that they are practicing anal sex for birth control. They know where babies come from. Did you know that? <laughs> women, even illiterate women, know how to make a baby. And they also know they already have 10 children and they can't feed them or give them health care. And they're worried about these kids. And they want to do the best they can by them. And they also live in a society where I lived in, in Brazil, where if, you, if your husband comes home and says he wants sex, you can't say no, it's not rape. If he says, well, we are having sex, whether or not you're in the mood. And so these women's husbands would come home drunk or very aggressive, and they would want sex. 
And the women knew it was the time of the month that if they had unprotected sex, they were going to get pregnant and have yet another child that they couldn't feed or take care of properly. And so they would perform anal sex or oral sex on their husbands in order to keep from getting pregnant. And so uh, most people were rather shocked by this. No one had actually thought it through. But they found that throughout the world, many times poor women use unprotected anal sex in order to prevent conception. They know what time of the month is dangerous. They know that they cannot have sex unprotected. They can't afford food, much less a 25 cent condom. And remember, in many countries, it's a lot like where I was when I was growing up. In Brazil, condoms were legal, but you had to have permission from your parents, written permission, and the pharmacist kept them behind the counter in a safe because so many people protested them and the church protested them. So even though you could get them, you had to have some, I mean, you know, who's going to ask their parents for a note to take to a pharmacist? So were they really available? No. And so uh, in these countries, women were using anal sex for birth control. Now here's another thing. In Brazil, uh, they, in the old days, we're not talking now, but in the early days of AIDS, all the way back to the 80s, the average number of years that a woman was engaged was 10. We're lucky if we get 10 minutes in this country. <laughs> you know, they get engaged the next week, they're planning a wedding. In Brazil, they stayed engaged 10 years, and that's the average. So some people stayed longer than that. Why? Because of the economic circumstances and the traditions. In Brazil, uh, the bride's family didn't pay for the wedding. It's not the tradition there like it is here. Who pays for the wedding? The bride and groom pay for the wedding. So they have to work and save up money to rent the church, to buy the dress, to pay the preacher, to pay the priest, to have the little, uh, you know, uh, what do they call it, traditional dinner before the wedding, where they have the practice wedding. All of the, yeah, the reception, and afterward, uh, the, yeah, the, all of that, not only that, but in Brazil, the tradition is you provide, your, you rent the house and furnish it before you get married and move in. So all of those things take a lot of time and a lot of money, and they're saving it up. Now think about it if you were a girl, a single girl in Brazil, and you're engaged for 10 years. How are you going to keep that man from looking around for Betty Boobs and those other girls <laughs> that are out there trying to catch him? After all, you got him, and he's got a good job, and he's a decent guy, but men will be men. So you've got to keep him interested for 10 years. And Brazil has a law saying that if on the night after your wedding, your husband declares before a priest that you were not a virgin, it's annulled. Like that. So you've got to maintain your virginity and keep him interested for 10 years. And remember, there's still Betty Boobs out there shaking it at him <laughs> all the time. So, this is a real problem. The women had to maintain virginity because if in the ninth year they gave themselves to their fiancé and he dumped them and left for somebody else, they were ruined commodities. They couldn't go to the next guy and say, listen, uh, I got this much saved and we can be engaged for five years and get married, but I couldn't uh, keep my last uh, boyfriend and I had to give up my virginity, so let's get married. You think he's going to say, oh, yeah, let's do that. Mm -hmm. So, they used anal sex traditionally, not just as an uh, emergency measure 
for being really poor, but they used it in all levels of society. They used anal sex to maintain virginity during engagement. So, Bowling and Bowler did statistical analysis and came up with there's a huge number of people practicing a very unsafe behavior. So, anyway, that's the most dangerous. Next most dangerous is plain old boy-girl sex, vaginal sex. It's safer than anal sex because there's an average of three to five layers of cells before you get to a little capillary system in the vagina. But, remember, lining the cervix are what kind of cells? Langer hands. Langer hands. And so that's how women get infected. It's not by diapathesis through to the capillaries. It's most likely by infected white blood cells exploding and releasing particles that infect the Langer hand cells. So a woman is 25 to 35 times more likely to get infected from a male than a male is from a female. Why Langer hand cells? And what's the other reason? What can you think? Now, think about, I know this is really dirty and exciting on a Monday morning at 8.30. You know, everybody wants to think dirty at 8.30 in the morning on a Monday. And all we want to do is think about sleeping. But anyway, remember the sex act. I'm sure some of you can re probably think back to actually doing it. All right? Uh, what happens when a male and a female copulate? Something goes out of the male, and then remember, there's always sucking back in. Where there's a reaction, there's an equal and opposite. So who gets the most inoculation, the largest volume of inoculation? The woman. She gets a lot more semen in her with infected white blood cells that a man picks up in vaginal secretions from his ejaculation. So one, he gets less. Two, he doesn't have a infected or uh, the mucous membranes of the urethra are not an, a wonderful site for picking up the virus. But cervix with Langerhans cells ill are. So remember, a man is more likely to get away with it than a female. A female's getting more volume and she has those cells that no one can protect unless they have a diaphragm or a condom. So remember that women are more likely to get infected from an inf infected male with a high viral load than the opposite. So males have lighter hand cells in the foreskin but not in their urethra. Right. And since if they're circumcised, they're gone, the lighter hand cells are gone, they're less likely to pick up. So it's all about volume and, and susceptible cells. Um, oral sex. Thank you, Mr. Clinton, <laughs> for misleading an entire generation of America into thinking oral sex isn't sex. It is. My nephews, I have seven, you remember, and they go from age 28 all the way down to age 14. And I asked them, you know, have you, do you know about HIV and uh, protecting yourself? And yeah, they all knew everything, of course. And then I said, so you all use condoms? And they said, well, we really don't need to. And I said, what do you mean you don't need to? Well, we don't have sex. And I said, that's what you tell your mother. What do you tell me? <laughs> and they said, no, no, we swear, we don't have sex. And I said, so you're not having sex. 28 years old, unmarried Marine, not having <laughs> sex. Uh -huh. Yeah, your mother may believe that, I don't. And they said, well, most of the time we don't have sex. And I said, okay, most of the time. Now we're getting somewhere. And they said, well, we have oral sex, and that's not sex. And they call it sex, so don't you think it's sex? Well, if it's oral, you see, the only thing that's really sex, that's really dangerous, is when a penis enters a vagina. I said, are you way out of crazy? <laughs> so remember that oral sex, yes, 
it is a lot less dangerous than the other kinds of sex, but people have been infected from oral sex. And again, it has, it's just like up here with needle sharing. What's the viral load of the person that's donating fluid? If their viral load is high, uncontrolled, they don't know they're infected, and they have a high viral load, then the danger is higher, can be as high as 30%. Why? Because people bite the insides of their mouth. They bite the inside of their cheek, or they have bleeding gums, or they have a tooth pull. And if you have holes in your epithelium, and you get donated fluids that have a high viral load, you're going to get infected. If we're talking about everyday life, probably not. Everyday life, first of all, the person you're with is unlikely to be positive. If they are positive, we live in a civilized society where most people get treated and their viral load is undetectable and your chances of getting infected are very small. They run in real life around 2%. But lots of people don't know they have bleeding gums. So remember, if you have pyrrhea, bleeding gums, a tooth extraction, or some sort of uh, abrasion to the inside of your mouth, you're more likely to get it. And then the person that you're getting the fluids from, if they have a high viral load, you're also more likely. Remember that the person that's going, ooh, ooh, that feels good, is in no danger. <laughs> it's the person receiving vaginal secretions or semen in the mouth that's in danger. Not the person going, ooh, a little bit to the left. <laughs> okay? Your left, not mine. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So remember that oral sex is sex, and it can have as high as a 30% risk if you have bleeding gums, a tooth extraction, and the person that you're receiving fluids from, vaginal fluids or semen, has a high viral load. Well, the one we wanted to get to today that it took us almost an hour to get to was pregnancy and HIV. Number one thing to remember, the virus does not cross the placenta. It does not cross the placenta. But it can be transmitted by a fall where the mother's blood supply leaks into the baby's. So if she gets hit or in an accident or falls down steps and she gets a small bleed into the baby's blood system, that can infect the baby if she has high viral load. What if you've got her on antiretrovirals and her viral load is undetectable, then it's unlikely she will infect the baby. Now, how do babies get infected? One, during pregnancy by some sort of access to the mother. Two, during birth, when mother's blood gets in baby's eyes or umbilical cord. Cut. Remember, it's the blood that infects. And if she has a low viral load that's undetectable, the blood's not going to be infectious. So that's what we try to do. We try to get, a, it's now law in the United States that if you are found to be pregnant, they test you for HIV. If you're found to be positive, they will offer you the drugs to keep the viral load at zero. If you keep the viral load at zero, you can make it almost safe for the baby. Uh, remember that we haven't talked about this, but should vaginal secretions or semen get in the eye, it is very easy to get infected. You can see the blood vessels in your eyes. So people have been infected by blood, vaginal secretions, and semen getting in their eye. Uh, at Martin Luther King Hospital, a woman, a nurse, was taking vacutainers. Everybody knows what a vacutainer is, where you take blood and it sucks it into this vacuum tube. All right, the little rubber stopper in the vacuum tube seemed to be almost out, and she was worried about it spilling, so she tried to force it in, and it popped out and blew into her face. She got HIV from highly infected blood that she had taken in an emergency room and gotten it. Another woman uh, had gotten off of a 12-hour shift. She was exhausted. She wore gloves for 12 hours. 
You know how sweaty and chapped your hands get? She taken, had changed out of her uh, universal precautions and everything. She was leaving the emergency room when someone came in with a gunshot bleeder that was just shooting way up in the air and she held it with her hands without glove on. Saved the guy and got HIV. So remember, your hands are going to be all trapped, but they're all going to be, um, you know, you're going to have little abrasions and little chapped areas, and they're all going to be puffy from being in gloves all day long. They're much more susceptible then when you take off gloves, so for goodness sake, don't get infected blood on your hands. Uh, don't get it in your eye, and remember, semen and vaginal secretions in the eye or on the hands after all day long or working with them can be a problem. All right, uh, breastfeeding. If a woman has uncontrolled viral load, breastfeeding is right at the number of particles that can infect another person. So, if it takes 250,000 viral particles per mil to infect, a person, breast milk, in someone that has uncontrolled viral load is 240,000. So babies have been infected by breastfeeding. Now, you say to yourself, if a woman knows she's positive, how does a baby get breastfed? Because in some countries they can't afford formula. And in some places, babies have been taken from HIV negative mothers that were killed in some sort of accident and given to someone else in the village that was positive to breastfeed. And the babies got infected. So, uh, breastfeeding is a danger if the person's viral load is high. Now, what if you're poor and you can't get HIV drugs? I mean, there are many places, even with the Clinton initiative to give you know, to provide HIV to every woman or person in Africa that's HIV positive, one tablet per day, and that's their big one. They've done amazing work there with that. What if you're positive and you know it, and you've got a baby that's negative? It's a very important issue if you can't afford formula. So what we have discovered is that women in South Africa, and remember, South Africa is one of the most infected countries in the world. Uh, there's a big problem in South Africa because they've had two presidents that didn't, that were AIDS denialists, that said it didn't exist, and did not provide for testing or treatment, and they did a lot of harm. And then there is this, throughout sub-Saharan Africa, there is this rumor thing that's going around that's often passed by witch doctors and people that are not really educated where if a male that has HIV has sex with a female that doesn't, it's sucked out of him and put in her. And so that's why every 30 seconds a child is raped in South Africa. It's the leading rape capital of the world because Uneducated people believe that if they rape a child that is negative, that the HIV will be pulled out of them. And so uh, it is a sad state of affairs. But anyway, that means that there are a lot of women in South Africa that have been raped that get pregnant. And here they are worried about their child, and they don't have money for formula. So they were told that if they breastfed, it's likely the baby will be infected, but they don't have money for formula. So what do they do? And this is one of the things that kind of shocks me about America, about women in general, is that they will sit there and worry about this and figure out a way to save their children. And women in South Africa figured out that if they express their breast milk into a tin cup, and bring it to a slow